So, we are all set, I guess. Welcome to today's webinar on global hot topics in deceptive price advertising, hosted by the Global Advertising Lawyers Alliance, Gala. My name is Jonas, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. I am a counsel with Fisher Attorneys at Law in Zurich, Switzerland, and advertising and marketing law is part of my key practice. Using comparative prices in advertising is one of the evergreens to influence customers in their purchase decision, be it a reference to a price one previously applied or to a price of a competitor. In my practice, I recently noticed an increase of inquiries of online retailers who wanted to know whether nudging their customers with a specific technique is legit under Swiss law. This, for instance, included the implementation of a countdown clock on their website with respect to a certain sale and other so-called dark patterns. I also noticed a considerable increase of enforcement activity in Switzerland with respect to deceptive price advertising lately. This is why I thought it would make sense or it would be worth discussing the current hot topics in deceptive price advertising around the globe. And I am very thrilled that top shot experts in the advertising and marketing law from the USA, the UK, Canada, and Turkey will join me for this webinar. This includes Pavana Kumar, who is a partner with Davis and Gilbert in New York City, US. And it also includes Brinsley Dresden, who is a partner with Louis Silkin in London, UK. And Kelly Harris, who is the principal of Harris & Co. in Toronto, Canada. And last but not least, Baran Yunay, who is a managing associate with Grinan Partners in Istanbul, Turkey. So a great pleasure to have you all with me. Thank you very much for joining. And finally, I would like to let you know on a housekeeping that you may raise any questions uh, through the chat or via the Q&A. We will try to answer some of them at the end of the webinar. I will also raise some specific questions after each topic uh, we discussed. So without any uh, further ado, it is uh, my pleasure to pass on to uh, Pavana for the first part for the US part of the first topic. And this one is how is price advertising regulated? Thank you so much, Jonas. I think we can go to my first slide here. So we're going to start out with some of the basics and then we're going to drill down on some of the nuance and, and recent enforcement and, and hot topics in the US. But just by way of background, when we think about deceptive pricing, often what we're talking about is using a deceptively inflated reference price when you're advertising like say discounts. So for example, you have a crossed out price. Um, this ultimately is a, not a reference price that is reasonable. So a lot of states, including Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Oregon, have a stated safe harbor where you can use a reference price provided that the advertisers regularly offer that reference price to the public. It's typically for a third of any 90-day period, which is what we call the 2890 rule. Um, another metric that we use is if the advertiser or retailer has actually consummated a substantial number of sales at the reference price. Again, so that is a true established reference price when you do advertise a sale or a discount. It's not typically defined under statutory law, but it's about 40% in MA. The so next slide. California is a little bit less well-defined, and California, as we'll see from some of the examples later on in the webinar, is really a regulatory and class action hotbed. Um, there's a lot of activity and enforcement around advertising reference prices and comparison pricing in California. 
So I won't go through each of these slavishly in the interest of time, but essentially there is a prevailing market price metric, which is not as defined as under the other state laws. So prevailing market price may refer to the retailer's own price for the product if they're the only one selling the product. But if other retailers are also selling the product, the prevailing market price could also be determined with reference to the prices that the retailer's competitors are charging. So in California, courts will usually look to the most common price rather than the average price when determining what a prevailing market price is. So in California, that 2890 rule likely won't apply. So let's move on. All right, so I'm going to kick it back to Jonas to introduce Brinsley, who will take us through some of the overarching principles in the UK. Yes, thanks a lot, Pavana. So we are actually um, uh, going further with uh, Brinsley. And without any further ado, I would say, uh, Brinsley, the stage is yours. Brinsley is a partner of Louis Silking in London, UK. I need to unmute myself, which I've now done. Yeah, the, 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 what I just said was the really good bit. I'm sorry, and I can't repeat it again. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, the main piece of legislation in the United Kingdom is the Consumer Protection Regulations 2008, which implemented the uh, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive into UK law. And it is worth saying that at the moment, sort of kicking around in the UK legislative ether, there is a, a piece of law which, if it goes through, will either retain or repeal all of the uh, laws that we inherited from the European Union before Brexit. Um, this Reform and uh, Repeal Act or bill is mired in difficulty. It may never happen. Um, it's probably an attempt by the hardcore Brexiteers to torpedo any possibility of Britain ever rejoining the European single market. Um, so those of us who think that Brexit was a horrible mistake are very anxious that this doesn't happen. Uh, and it is looking increasingly difficult. Um, however, so as things stand, we've got the CPRs. They, they repealed 40 pieces of legislation uh, in, in 2008, massively simplified the law, introduced a high level general duty to trade fairly with consumers, and then introduced um, a prohibition on misleading acts or omissions if they have a transactional effect on a consumer, uh, which can be anything. It can be, for example, seeing a poster outside of a shop and then going into the shop because you've been tempted in by the poster, or it can be seeing a, an ad on Facebook and then clicking through to go to a, uh, an advertiser's landing page. Those are all transactional decisions. It's a much wider concept than should I buy or should I not buy? And so it's these duties um, of prohibiting misleading acts and omissions are, if you like, the key area of law. Jonas, if you could go to the next slide, please. Now, the regulations then are supplemented by um, 31, if you like, strict liability offences, which are always unfair. So for a prosecution to be landed, they don't need to show that transactional decision has been different. So some examples there are bait advertising or bait and switch advertising, um, false time limited offers and and this this is where we see the overlap with overlap with dark patterns because obviously countdown clocks uh which are, seem to be a big issue with regulators around the world at the moment are just actually an example of something which has been prohibited um by the cpr since 2008 because the clock counts down and then it just starts again um false claims to be a sort of you know closing down sales which are false that kind of thing and then using the term free when in actual fact, something isn't free, you have to pay something to take advantage of the offer. Now, the, the, the law was supplemented by these pricing practicing guidelines, um, which came out, I, if memory serves me correctly, at the end of 2015. Um, they're only guidance, they're not law. In some ways, they're very helpful. It's a very useful document. In other ways, it's a very frustrating document. Um, 
the Chartered Trading Standard Institute who produced it said, well, the, the law now that we've inherited or we've, we've implemented from Europe is principles based and therefore these guidelines are principles based. Um, but that actually can then make it very difficult to actually apply in practice because you're left asking these quite high level questions, which I think uh, we will get into in some later slides. Um, and then finally, on the self-regulatory side, so that's all the legal control on the self-regulatory side, we've got the, um, the very strong system of self-regulation in the UK administered by the Advertising Stands Authority for the CAP and BCAP codes for non-broadcast and broadcast advertising. An awful lot of complaints about um, comparative pricing issues or misleading price claims are actually dealt with by the ASA rather than by uh, trading standards, let alone the, the statutory regulator, the Competition Markets Authority. So that's the background for the UK, and I'm now going to pass the baton to Kelly, who's going to talk about Canada. Thank you, Brinsley, and thank you all for joining. Um, so just kind of kicking off with um, the regulation of price advertising in Canada. Um, you know, we're kind of focusing on price comparisons, but we have a number of different pricing prohibitions in Canada. Um, most of these are under the Competition Act, which is the federal legislation in Canada that governs misleading advertising and other deceptive marketing practices. The Federal Competition Act is enforced by the Competition Bureau of Canada, along with all of the other um, antitrust uh, prohibitions under the Competition Act. Um, so our Competition Act is largely an economic um, uh, enforcement statute. Um, and in that statute, we have a particular provision, which is a bit uncommon um, across uh, the globe, that regulates um, ordinary selling price provisions. And so this is a prohibition um, or a provision, I should say, that creates a substantiation test um, when making a comparison to a regular price, which you know, typically comes up in, in um, the context of a sale, you know, regular price X on sale for Y. Um, and this provision applies both to merchants making comparisons to their own regular price and also to the regular price in the market more generally. So I'll get into the details of this ordinary selling price um, provision and the tests under it to substantiate these kinds of uh, claims a little bit later on. Um, the Competition Act also has a general prohibition against making false or misleading representations. And recent amendments to the Act last summer codified drip pricing um, as an example of false or misleading representations. There are no other particular claims that are similarly um, made examples of false or misleading representations, but this change to the statute came about um, after some enforcement actions against drip pricing and um, the Bureau not wanting to prove every single time that it uh, was in fact a deceptive uh, representation. So, drip pricing um, under the Canadian Competition Act is um, defined as making representations of prices that are not attainable due to fixed obligatory charges or fees. And the only exception to this is um, an amount that's uh, imposed by an act of parliament or the legislature of a province, which is essentially, you know, sales tax. So, um, other than that, you need to include all fees in your price representations um, or else it could be potentially challenges drip pricing. There are some other pricing prohibitions in the Competition Act, um, particularly bait and, you know, prohibitions against bait and switch selling, selling something above an advertised price. But those are the key, uh, the key ones to keep in mind from a federal perspective. Um, and Canada is a federation, so we've got um, 10 provinces which have constitutional powers and um, other spheres of governance. Um, and many of the provinces have enacted consumer protection statutes that place additional obligations when contracting with consumers. Um, and most of these uh, consumer protection uh, acts have established prohibited practices, you know, sometimes called unfair practices. And some of these specific unfair practices concern pricing claims, and they're very detailed. Um, for example, in Ontario, under the Ontario Consumer Protection Statute, um, there is a particular pricing unf uh, unfair pricing um, prohibition. Um, so you cannot make a merchant cannot make a specific uh, a representation that a specific price advantage exists if it does not. Um, and so a merchant that engages in this kind of an unfair practice. 
um, you know, can be liable to statutory penalties. Um, but, uh, you know, perhaps more um, concerning is that um, when you engage as a merchant in an unfair practice, consumers can have the right to rescind their agreement um, or and or sue for damages. So, um, you can imagine that on a class basis could become a, a big problem for um, a merchant. Also wanted to um, flag that there are some industries in Canada that are further regulated um, to require all in pricing. Um, this was before the drip pricing provisions came um, came out in the in the summer of last year. So, for example, the travel industry is required to um, under its you know kind of industry uh, statutes to um, ensure that their price claims are all in that additional fees are not added. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not also mention our self regulatory code. So ad standards is the industry self regulatory body for the advertising industry in Canada. And it um, administers and provides pre clearance function um, against its Canadian code of advertising standards. And um, the code has, you know, it's essentially. Uh, um, reproduces legal requirements um, and in the pricing context clause 3. Um, prohibits making, um, you know, deceptive price claims or discounts, um, making unrealistic price comparisons or exaggerated claims as to worth or value. Um, there's some guidance in, in that clause as well about, um, you know, qualifying statements such as up to or percentages off that they must be easily readable and close to the price that's quoted. Um, and it also has a, a provision um, that's very similar to the ordinary selling price provision, which requires references to a regular price to be substantiated either based on volume sold at that price or the time that it was offered at that regular price. So I will leave that there for Canada and we'll come back to the, the details of the tests in a little while after you've heard from, I think we are going to Baran. Is that right? Yes. Yes, thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, the topic is how is price advertising regulated? Uh, it is regulated in detail in Turkey. The main legislation is Turkish Commercial Code and Co Consumer Protection Law, but these laws rule the main principles for advertising, like the main principles uh, like honesty and accuracy of advertisements are directly applicable for price advertis advertisements too. False claims and misleading price advertising are forbidden. However, these laws do not clarify what would be the false and misleading price advertising. So we have the advertising regulation, which was enacted as per consumer protection law, and it sets for detailed rules for price advertising and discount sale advertising in Turkey. There are time limits for price and discount advertisements. The pricing is banned, false claims are forbidden, for example. In addition to those, in 2022, the Advertisement Board, which is the main uh, authority uh, surveying the advertisements in all media in Turkey, published guideline for price advertising in Turkey. This guideline is intended to enlighten and unify the implementation of advertising regulation and consumer protection law. The guideline contains tips for best practice in addition to the fundamental principles mentioned above, I mean, in other uh, piece of legislations, uh, the provisions are very detailed in the guideline. I just listed some important uh, do's and don'ts uh, for you to mention uh, in this webinar. For example, uh, the price must be the price of a product or a service must be the total selling price of the good or a service, including all taxes, expenses, and additional costs. So I can say that the pricing is forbidden in Turkey, like in other jurisdictions, in some of other uh, jurisdictions uh, as well. And uh, for example, sales prices uh, should be stated as Turkish lira, which is the uh, national shape, I mean or they should be stated with this specific symbol for Turkish lira. Um, what we see most is the claims like up to, from, or to. Uh, these claims and these statements should be included in legible sizes for uh, consumers. Uh, the terms such as all, everything, they shouldn't be used unless a price. Uh, 
uh, or discount at this time advertisement apply uh, to all goods or services in the store or in a specific category. Uh, if there is time or uh, amount limit, uh, or if the price uh, is available for a limited uh, period, this should be uh, specified and this should be communicated to the uh, consumers. Uh, untrue claims uh, that a good or service will be offered for a very limited uh, period of time uh, aim at um, influencing the consumer uh, to make a sudden decision uh, and depriving him of the necessary opportunity or time to make uh, an informed choice are a uh, dissolved, like uh, I will also mention uh, in later uh, topics in detail about this. Thank you. So thanks all of you guys for uh, contributing to this first chapter. Um, just a very brief uh, question that one goes out to uh, Pavana. So um, I was wondering if in your view, is there any US state that you would say is always or most of the times uh, at the forefront of the advertising regulation? Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on this where California is extremely aggressive. Um, I also want to flag, and we're going to get to this later in the deck, there is, there's a lot of state uh, regulatory activity around subscription programs specifically, as well as the federal regulations about dark patterns and drip pricing. So in the interest of time, we're going to turn to that in a little bit later in the deck. But I would say for sure, California is at the forefront of both comparative general price advertising regulation, as well as subscription specific issues. But again, that's a that's a 50 state issue that we'll get into a little more detail soon. Great. Thank you very much, Barana. So um, yes, then I would say we move on to the next uh, chapter. So um, we want to shed some light on um, what the rules on comparing prices are uh, in each of the uh, time, each of the uh, jurisdictions and if there are any time limits. So again, I pass on to you, Havana. Yeah, so, and again, we're going to get into some of the more specifics, and so I'll, I'll move through this pretty quickly in the interest of time since we only have an hour, but when you're doing former price advertising, so that's advertising a regular price, original price, or a former price, that price has to be the actual bona fide price at which the article was actually offered to the public on a regular basis for a reasonably substantial period of time. So that could be a pretty fact-specific endeavor, and we frequently work with our clients on figuring out, is it really a bona fide price and can we fairly advertise it in this way? So for example, advertising a fictitious higher price for the purpose of inflating a perceived discount is forbidden by the applicable laws. You know, and although there's no specific requirement on the FTC level for sales to have been made at the reference price, if you don't have substantial sales, it can be harder to demonstrate that the reference price was legitimate. So again, on this specific issue, quite a fact specific endeavor. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, again, this kind of goes to Joseph's point, California was a real class action hotbed here. These are just a couple of examples of the types of settlements we're looking at when ma major retailers are in the crossfire here. Next slide. Um, another really big issue is perpetual sales. So if you're constantly advertising that you're running a sale, right, it's not really a sale. The consumer thinks there's some benefit, that they're getting some kind of savings or discount, but it's not actually the case. So here are some examples of settlements. This is an older one, but I think it's a great example. Joseph A. Bank uh, settled with the New York AG over allegations that it constantly advertised sales during a five-month period. Only 1% of its suits were sold at what they were saying was the regular price. Um, similarly, in 2013, Hobby Lobby settled in Oklahoma with that state attorney general when it advertised 50% off and 30% off certain products for more than 52 consecutive weeks. And at that rate, it's not really a discount. So let's move on. Again, reference pricing has to be made against the actual prices offered for merchandise that's of the similar kind and quality and features of the advertised item. So this is going back to the bona fide price concept, but again, it has to actually be for apples to apples for that actual product. Next. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Brindley to run through the UK and our other countries, and then we're going to get into the weeds a little bit more. Yes, thank you. And I'll also try and go through this reasonably quickly because it's really all in the slides. I mentioned the CTSI guidelines before, and they, they set out very helpful guidance when you're trying to decide whether a reference price, so your before price uh, is your reference price, is that genuine? And so there's a series really of five key questions you can ask. 
how long was the product on sale at that higher price? Um, how many outlets, if you're a multiple retailer, was it only actually in one outlet where you sold it at a higher price or was it in all of your outlets? Um, how long ago did the higher price apply? Is it now so long ago that actually the new price is effectively the real price? Um, are you making a comparison with an out of season price? So are you comparing your price with an old price that actually, you know, only applies when there's no demand because it's a seasonal kind of product? Um, and did you make significant sales at the higher price or did you reasonably expect to do so? Um, next slide, please. The other kind of uh, big issue, um, which the guidelines um, go into are, are, if you like, general savings claims. So obviously you see this in stores or on, on websites up to 50% off. If you're going to make that kind of um, claim, it's got to reflect the reality of the offer to not be misleading. And that maximum reduction has got to apply to a significant proportion of the range of products. And what is a significant proportion, I hear you ask? And I say, this is the problem with principles based guidance. We don't know. It's significant, whatever that might be. Very, very difficult. The old guidance was very prescriptive and formulaic, uh, which was in some ways um, silly, but it did mean there was certainty where you could you could advise clients with certainty about what would be OK. Now we just have this principle. It must be a significant proportion, but who knows what that means? Um, it's got to, you know, got to go into the true overall picture. Um, and any qualifications about up to and from any exclusions, for example, have got to be clearly and prominently shown. One thing I did want to mention was that years and years ago, when I used to work with Gala colleagues on these issues, I do remember um, colleagues in continental Europe would say, oh, well, in my country, I think Belgium and Luxembourg might have had these kinds of laws. There were specific weeks of the year when you were allowed to run a sale. Um, and you weren't allowed to run sales at other times of year, which always seemed a bit odd uh, to a, a UK lawyer. But those were the, that was the position in some European countries. We don't have any of that kind of thing anymore. And since the um, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive came into force um, in 2008, I don't think that the continental European countries do either. Uh, but I just wanted to nail that specifically as it kind of related, I think, to the question that Jonas was um, asking us. So now I think it's over to Kelly. Thank you, Brinsley. Um, so Canada is a little bit um, different than some other jurisdictions in that we do have a very specific test um, uh, to substantiate a uh, price comparison federally. Um, and this test is based in the Competition Act, um, but a lot of it comes from um, enforcement guidance from the Competition Bureau, um, which was accepted by a specialized tribunal that heard uh, the Sears case back in 2002. Um, and, and, and so it's, you know, it's not quite law, but it is essentially law that this, um, uh, th this test needs to be satisfied in order to make a, a price comparison. So there's actually two tests. There's one based on time and one based primarily on volume. The volume test is a little bit harder to meet. So typically um, retailers will use the time test. And there are two, um, and, and again, this applies both to uh, a representation to a merchant's own price. So it was X, now Y, um, but also, you know, compare at prices to the market in general. Um, and so the test has two parts, the, and it's a bit confusing because the time has, test has the time part of the test and also the good faith part. Um, so the, the time part of the test is just a calculation of days. So for um, at least 50% of the time in the six months prior to making the sale representation, um, the reference price needs to be the, uh, the regular price um, advertised for at least 50% of that time. So the way that you do that is every day of the sale, you look back six months and make sure that at least 50% of the, the days in that previous six months, um, you were selling that product at that price um, or, or a higher price. Um, and then if you meet that time test, which is just a calculation, 
um, you still need to ensure that that regular price was offered in good faith. And what does good faith mean? Um, you know, as, as Brinsley says, it's a bit qualitative. The Bureau has given some um, factors to consider uh, to establish good faith. So things like, you know, was the product openly available in appropriate volumes at that regular price? Um, did you base your reference price on sound pricing principles? Um, was your price reasonable in light of competition in the market? Um, you know, was that a price that the merchant fully expected the market to validate whether or not they actually did um, have those sales? Um, and the, the real key um, part of the good faith analysis is that you had a good faith um, minimum volume. And, you know, what that percentage is, is, um, you know, a bit, a bit murky. There isn't a, a percentage that is in the Bureau's guidance. Um, but at around 18% of regular price volume um, is likely a low legal risk. Um, as you get lower, closer to 15, closer to 10, um, you know, the risk that that's not sufficient volume sold at the regular price, um, you know, your, your risk is going to get a bit higher. There are some exceptions to this, um, you know, ordinary selling price test, um, which is in the Bureau's guidance. Things like a clearance sale, uh, references to MSRP, which is you know, manufacturer suggested retail price, um, some exceptions for making an introductory sale and using a reference period after the sale period, um, and some exceptions for seasonal items where you know six months might be insane for some products, um, you know that may be in the market for less than six months. So how could you possibly be selling it? Um, for, you know, at the regular price for six months. Um, the Bureau's example there is Christmas lights, um, but sub in any other seasonal product um, and you might be able to qualify for a shorter reference period at, at which you have to sell at the, that regular price. Um, there is also, um, as I mentioned, Ad Standards Clause 3, of the Self-Regulatory Code, which has very similar requirements um, with respect to claims like regular price, suggested retail price, manufacturer list price, Fair market value. So those kinds of claims, which are very similar to the ordinary selling price representations, um, ad standards has a requirement that you can't make those claims or they're considered to be deceptive unless you can, you know, point to a substantial period of time or volume at which you've sold that that regular price. All right. So with that, we'll move over to, to Turkey. Baran, go ahead. Thank you, Kelly. Well, as a general rule, competitive advertising is permitted in Turkey. Uh, however, as an exception, explicit comparison is banned. It doesn't matter even if it is a price comparison or any other comparison. Uh, it is not allowed to mention the rival's name, trademark, distinctive size, or any other uh, characteristic features. When it comes to competitive price advertising, it is only allowed to compare the prices based on non-objective criteria. So I can say that this is a really limited area in Turkey if you want to uh, conduct the comparing, uh, comparing pri uh, comparative price advertising in Turkey. Um, there is an important rule about the time limits. Uh, the lowest price uh, applied within the last 30 days prior to the application of the discount should be taken as a basis in determining the sales price of the goods or services before the discount. So if you make two separate discounts within the same 30 days, the discounted price offered in the first discount should be taken into consideration for calculation of the discount amount for the second discount. Uh, so this seems a, a little bit complicated, but indeed uh, you should be careful when making comparative uh, price advertising about this rule. Uh, the advertisement board uh, is really, really uh, Takes take care of this rule and uh, imposes important uh, sanctions uh, to those who are violating uh, these rules. Thank you. Thank you all again, and uh, also to Baran. I wasn't aware of that uh, fact. It was uh, yeah enlightening. So thanks a lot for the sharing that. Um, so I do have a uh, question that goes out to Kelly this time. Um, so I was wondering if it's the same um, in Canada. So we do under Swiss law, we do treat, uh, let's say free add-ons to a certain product. We do um, treat that as it was a 
uh, discounted products. So I was wondering whether in Canada this uh, is the same or whether you would say this uh, is treated differently. Um, I think, you know, you have to be careful with bonus items in Canada and, and I'll, I'll mention it in, in the couple upcoming slides, but there are some um, specific uh, requirements in Quebec under the consumer protection statute to not exaggerate your bonus items. So you need to, um, you can't place more emphasis on the premium versus the thing that you're actually selling. So that's one thing to, to watch out for. Um, and I think, you know, if you're bundling products um, and making a, a pricing representation, you do need to be careful, right? That, that you're, if you're calling it a bonus item and you're referencing the regular price, um, if you're adding in the, the value of that bonus item, um, you need to look at your pricing history um, to substantiate that. So it's something that you would have to kind of look at on a case by case, but it's not necessarily a requirement to treat it as a discounted product. Perfect, thanks a lot. So, then we uh, will move to the core of it, uh, to the uh, dark patterns. So um, I was um, wondering, or um, just want to hear from, from the speakers, what dark patterns related to price advertising they see uh, in their practice and how they are tackled by regulation. So Pavana, stage is yours. Great, so let's start here. So we're going to hear a lot about dark patterns, I'm sure, from all of my colleagues here. Um, you know, broadly in the United States, dark patterns is not, other than under some privacy laws, specifically defined, but they're generally being looked at by federal and state regulators as design tactics on e-commerce sites or other purchase flows that essentially trick consumers into taking an action they otherwise wouldn't have taken. We'll talk about some of those broader issues under dark patterns, such as strip pricing and countdown clocks, and we have some great visual examples. But I wanted to start out by talking about subscription programs because I really cannot emphasize enough how laser focused the FTC, the state regulators and the class action bar are in subscription programs. Specifically, there's obviously been a huge explosion in the development of these programs uh, through various retailers. A lot of that's spurred on by the pandemic, but you know, from startups to big box stores, you know, subscription programs are really ubiquitous. Um, and there's a lot of distaste for them um, on the federal and the state level. So I'm just going to recap some of the current regulations and then look at where the regulations are going because there's a lot of current activity. Um, the current patchwork of laws is honestly kind of a mess and, and we're moving in the U.S. towards a more unified way of codifying how to be compliant without looking at all 50 state laws. Um, but on the federal level, we currently have ROSCA, the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act, Broadly, it prohibits charging a consumer through a negative option feature, which is a feature such as a free trial conversion or subscription program where you're taking someone's silence as essentially consent to renew the offer unless they cancel. You have to clearly and conspicuously disclose the material terms before you obtain their billing information. So that would be prior to the checkout page, but ideally as early as possible in the process. Obtain the consumer's express informed consent before charging the consumer, ideally something like a checkbox or substantially similar method. We'll talk a little bit more about what express informed consent might look like because the regulators have hopefully, uh, at least so far, shied away from specifically telling us what that means. And then provide simple mechanisms for a consumer to stop recurring charges. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the FTC has currently proposed even more specificity about what exactly simple mechanisms and immediate cancellation means. Um, but ideally um, as immediate as possible without upselling your consumer. So next slide. So the majority of US states either have an automatic renewal law or are currently considering post automatic renewal laws. I think it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go specifically through each state, but here are some of the key ones. Again, the challenge for companies in the current climate is complying with the FTC regulations as well as its patchwork of state regulations some of which have you know, varying requirements for things like reminder notices, varying requirements for exactly how you have to make the disclosures. Like for example, in Vermont, certain disclosures have to be in bold type font. Some states do specify that you have to have a checkbox for express informed consent. Um, it makes it very, very challenging for companies to feel that they are able to comply with this nationwide patchwork of laws. Um, what we currently do is we work with companies to say, do you want to bifurcate your approach, depending on where you have the highest consumer bases? Is it easier to take a lowest common denominator approach and, and be the most conservative? Um, to date, that's really been the approach that most companies have taken. But as we'll get to now that the federal regulators are proposing new rulemaking on negative option features, it may become somewhat easier to comply by, by using that as the lowest common denominator, essentially. Next slide. 
So the FTC has put out what it calls an enforcement policy statement on dark patterns. This came out late last year and described some of the tactics broader than subscription programs that the consumers that the FTC believes could be effective. So one of them, obviously, we just talked about unauthorized charges or ongoing bit billing that's difficult or impossible to cancel. But the FTC also brought cases against companies that hid important payment information um, until the end of the process or buried in inconspicuous places, pages beyond the initial offer page, hyperlinks at checkout, and other ways that um, fees are hidden. Um, made consumers wait on hold or listen to lengthy ads before they could cancel. Um, the FTC is also very focused on attempts to save the consumer. Um, so actually in their current proposed rulemaking, they've said that you actually should be getting affirmative consent to upsell a consumer. And if they don't want to be upsold to, you have to immediately allow them to cancel. So that's going to make it very difficult for consumer for companies to engage in basically saving the consumer efforts going forward, um, which is obviously, again, very challenging. Um, the FTC is also on broad actions against companies that fail to disclose that widely advertised material benefits of a consumer subscription are no longer available. So someone's paying the same price for a subscription that now doesn't carry the value that they paid for. I'm going to run through some very quick visual examples to allow my colleagues to take the stage on this, but let's go to the next slide. So here are some visuals of um, FTC staff report um, examples of a fictional, uh, fictitious company um, so that we can understand exactly what they're talking about with each of these types of design elements. So let's move on. So here's one example of a dark pattern. This is in the appendix to the FTC staff report. It's a really helpful read just for visualizing this kind of thing. So a baseless countdown timer could be a dark pattern because you're basically encouraging consumers to purchase out of some false sense of urgency. Look at the next one. So another example, Kelly and my other colleagues have already mentioned this, but drip pricing is another example that the FTC has cited as a dark pattern. Here's a convenience fee that's tacked on at the end and wasn't disclosed up front. Next one, unexpected subscriptions. So someone that doesn't understand that they're gonna be paying on an automatically renewing basis. Here you can see an automatic payment. It's a tiny little disclosure way down below the complete purchase button. Someone that's just clicking through might just see 14 day free trial and not understand that they're actually signing up for a subscription program. Next one. Um, all right, I think those are my examples. I will turn it over to Brinsley. Uh, I believe there have been some very recent updates in the UK as well, so looking forward to hearing about those. Thank you, Pavna. So I'm not going to I'm not going to get bogged down in definitions and things because Pavna's really covered that and all the things that are of concern to regulators in the states are the same as the things that are of concern to regulators in the UK. So trip pricing, countdown clocks. Um, all that sort of thing, Th those are the main concerns. So if we could go to the next slide, please. This is a useful example though. So this is a specific recent UK example, and you can see um, this company, Emma Mattresses, um, and they were using these discounts up to 60% off. So you've got your reference price is the unstated full price. We don't know what the full price was, but these savings claims uh, are, are in here. So if you go to the next slide, please. So this is just a sort of um, illustration, I think, of how the regulatory concern about dark patterns is emerging. So over a year ago now, the, the self-regulatory body, the Advertising Standards Authority, did an investigation or published the outcome of an investigation into Emma mattresses. And if you'd like to have a copy of that, uh, get in touch with me and I'll send you the link. Um, and it was about misleading reference prices um, and the, you know, the fact that these higher prices probably hadn't been charged for an awfully long time. Um, and there was also the, the use of things like countdown clocks or the equivalent uh, and the implication that the offers being made were time limited, when in fact it was just the lower price of the product. Um, what we've then seen, and we're seeing this increasingly, there's, if you like, a kind of escalation. So it starts off with the ASA investigating something, publishing their decision, causes the reputational damage to the advertiser. They then obviously sort of pass the baton to the Competition and Markets Authority, the statutory regulator, our equivalent of the Federal Trade Commission. And they have launched an investigation into Emma mattresses, which they did in November last year really looking at effectively the same issues. And this is part of a wider investigation 
into dark patterns uh, which the which the CMA is engaged in. So we're really taking our lead, I think, from the states, or maybe the states are taking their lead from us. Who can say? Um, Kelly, over to you. Thanks, Brinsley. And I don't know. I think Canada might might have been first on this scene. We just didn't give it the the cool name like the FTC. <laughs> um, so yeah. So some examples of of dark patterns. You know, thank you, Pavana, for the examples. They're likely all of those are likely to be considered false or misleading representations or an unfair practice in Canada. So I think our jurisdictions are really aligned. Um, and you know, these kinds of um, uh, you know, misleading representations are also, uh, you know, a key enforcement priority um, in Canada. Um, some examples of which we'll get into in the next few slides, but I just wanted to bring up that the Competition Bureau, um, they didn't call it dark patterns, but um, last week published a new volume of its ongoing deceptive marketing practices digest. So we're on number six, um, and it has a whole section on what it calls fake scarcity cues online. Um, and gives the example, uh, a pricing example of claims that, you know, certain prices are only available for a, a limited time, you know, urging consumers to, to hurry or act fast. So that's clearly, um, you know, we're aligned with the UK and, and the US um, on this issue being um, an enforcement priority. Um, in terms of other uh, dark patterns, um, obviously drip pricing, um, I've already covered that an example of a dark pattern that's been on the Bureau's radar for a number of years, and there's been enforcement actions on drip pricing, um, for, you know, many, many of them over the last uh, several years. Um, and uh, another big one um, that's been subject to enforcement are subscription traps. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Consumer transactions are regulated provincially under consumer protection legislation, including specific kinds of consumer agreements like online agreements uh, with consumers. And in order for those to be enforceable, uh, there are specific disclosures that merchants need to make online um, in order to, to complete that sale um, and, and enforce it. Um, some of these disclosures are the terms that are typically at issue in dark patterns. So, you know, the fact that you're entering into a subscription. So your the term of your consumer agreement is a, a prescribed disclosure for the purposes of consumer protection statutes in Canada. Um, same like itemized prices, another prescribed disclosure. So if you're not making these disclosures in a clear manner uh, that has required the consumer or ensured the consumer has accessed the information is and is able to print and retain it. Not only are those likely unfair practices or actionable um, under the Competition Act, um, you know, it also gives consumers rescission rights in Canada. Um, another key requirement to ensure that your e-commerce transaction is um, enforceable is to provide an express opportunity to the consumer to accept or decline the agreement. So these these buttons that are not clear, like you know, uh, like a uh, okay, or, you know, you need to be really clear. This is, you are now entering into this agreement and um, you can't be dodgy about how you're um, asking people to agree to that. Um, another key dark pattern to watch out for in Canada, um, and, and thank you for the, the question, Jonas, um, free trials and um, bonus items. Um, so there are some very unique provisions um, in some provinces. Quebec is usually the, the one. Um, lots of love for Quebec, went to, to McGill for, no, for four years, but you got to watch out. Um, Quebec has a particular prohibition against, you know, advertising a premium um, and placing more emphasis on that premium versus the underlying thing that you're, you're getting or you're offering to the consumer. And there was class actions um, with some big names on this basis. And that issue was advertising the free trial and, and you know, and not advertising the also, you're signing up for a subscription that, that it continues. So you need to be careful about these kinds of representations and, and there is no clear line as to, you know, what, uh, you know, what is going to be um, uh, sufficient. Um, you know, our test is the general impression test at a federal level. So, you know, what is uh, an inexperienced, unsophisticated consumer um, in a rush going to take from this? It is your um, free trial, um, you know, overshadowing your subscription representation. Um, you know, that's a very qualitative analysis. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to Turkey. Baran. Thank you, Kelly. Um, here are some examples of the most common dark patterns. Uh, first of all, are hidden costs. Uh, 
The price given in the advertisements must be the total sales price of the goods or services, including all taxes or expenses, as I mentioned in the previous slides. Another example is triggering fear, fear of missing out. It cannot be stated that the good or service will only be provided within a very limited period of time under certain conditions. If there is a time or stock limit regarding the validity, this period or stock should definitely and clearly be stated in the advertisements to the consumers. Like in all jurisdictions, the pricing is another example of dark patterns. The price must be the total price, as I mentioned before, so I skip it. Misleading advertise, advertisements that create the in, impression that the discount is valid in all sales channels, although it is only valid in some sales points, is another example. Uh, we can see that the, it is stated that the discount is only applicable and available on online sales channels of a seller, but it is also available in the physical store. So this can be a form of um, dark pattern. It, it shouldn't be in that way. The discount should be applied to all sales channels of the seller. Ad advertisements directed for children or uh, other uh, sensitive people like uh, elder people or disabled people uh, are another form of a dark pattern pattern in Turkey uh, because additional care is uh, required for these uh, types of consumers and the advertisement board is very um, is very uh, careful and for surveying these types of uh, advertisements I also listed some dark patterns at the next slide uh, please uh, those kinds of advertisements and campaigns are specifically scrutinized by the advertisement board An aggravated burden of proof uh, is sought and accuracy of these campaigns are surveyed by the advertisement board. Those might be, for example, buy two, get one free campaigns or buy one, get one 50% with 50% discount campaigns. Uh, the claim suggesting best price, lowest price are risky because they need to be substantiated and considering that there are many various prices in the market it might be really difficult for an advertiser to successfully substantiate these claims that they have the best and lowest price another example is campaigns such as gift cards coupons a customer loyalty loyalty programs and rewards uh, as an except, exception to those, uh, on the other hand, I mean, uh, dynamic pricing like the ones uh, offered by Airways and personal, personalized discounts offered to some consumers uh, are not considered as a discount advertisement. So general advertising rules and requirements related with the burden with burden of proof are applied for these advertisements but i should underline again the board the advertisement board uh, is, secret, is strictly scrutinizing them so uh, the advertisers should be careful uh, when they are in the area of dark patterns uh, thank you so very instructive thank you all um, in the interest of time i suggest that i skip my next uh, question which would have gone out to brinsley but um, i will have another one at the end for brinsley so um, uh, we'll get to that uh, later so um, i will then move on to our uh, next topic and which is quite juicy i would say it's uh, the question of what the um, enforcement risk is and what likely sanctions are so Pavana, if you can take over, please. Of course. So this this is a little duplicate of what we already discussed, but I think it's a helpful metric just for the types of settlements you see for these sales pricing claims. So I mean, you're looking at this Old Navy 2022 settlement, um, $340 million in consumer restitution, um, and that was a reference pricing case. So just some scary numbers here to illustrate um, how bad it can be if you're especially a big box retailer and plaintiff's attorneys are really active in this area. Go to the next slide. So this one I did want to highlight um, since the FTC has historically 
not enforce civil penalties under ROSCA, that's the federal subscription law that I outlined earlier. This is a really recent case, it's from January of 2023, and it's the first case where the FTC has actually ordered a company to pay uh, monetary fines and civil penalties for violations of ROSCA, which really indicates where the FTC is headed going forward. Um, it's not just going to be consumer restitution. The other thing I did want to mention, in case we don't get to my last slide, I alluded to this before, but the FTC is currently issuing proposed rulemaking um, to its negative option rule, which is a federal law governing negative option programs. They've actually published um, in the federal register specific text of what they would propose, including more definition around what it means to affirmatively consent, um, how companies can attempt to save consumers, what it means to click to cancel. It could really be its entire own webinar, but it's a really, really good time to get familiar with what the FTC is proposing. We're currently in a public comment period. Now is the time to audit those subscription practices. So in the interest of time, if anyone is interested in learning more about those proposed updates, what that means, and what a subscription audit would look like, please just reach out uh, separately after the webinar. We can move on, Jonas. Yeah, so in the United Kingdom, um, the vast majority of regulatory enforcement is carried out by the Advertising Standards Authority. So the risk is reputational damage um, rather than fines. But occasionally, if there's a particularly egregious um, infringement, then either the Competition Markets Authority or local trading standards can bring legal action enforcing the consumer protection regulations. And the kind of most notable case of that was against the major UK supermarket chain Tesco. Um, and this literally this little old lady noticed that over, over the course of a, a very long period of time when she went into Tesco, they were always saying that the strawberries were on sale for half price. So she complained to Birmingham Trading Standards. They bought a prosecution. Um, Tesco were fined £300,000 and had to pay the prosecution £65,000, as well as their own defence costs, which I'm sure were more than the prosecution's cost. So probably cost them, you know, the best part of half a million pounds. Um, the sting in the tail is that the, the little old lady died before the case got to court. So she never she never got to see Tesco um, being held to account, which is rather sad. The other sting in the tail is that it's rumoured, I could put it no higher, that Tesco made two million pounds in profits as a result of this um, false and this leading promotion, and even if it cost them half a million pounds, they were still up uh, overall. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Brinsley. Um, so in terms of um, enforcement risk, I think overall, this is a really high area of enforcement um, for Canada. We don't have as many enforcement actions as you might see in, you know, by the FTC, but the, a lot of the um, deceptive marketing practices, federal enforcements have been in the, in the context of pricing claims. Um, you know, would be remiss without mentioning, of course, again, the, the provincial consumer protection um, statutes give consumers the right to rescind agreements, um, get damages, including in the context of an unfair practice, like a, like a, a deceptive pricing claim. So that's a huge risk, right? If, if you're basing all of your e-com sales on the basis of, you know, misleading representations, um, that's, a, that's a huge um, area of risk for, for an e-com business. Um, federally, you know, which we're dealing with general false or misleading representations, including drip pricing and the um, ordinary selling price requirements. Um, federal sanctions were bumped up astronomically last summer um, and are now the greater of either 10 million Canadian dollars um, or three times the value of the benefit obtained from the deceptive conduct. Um, and if that can't be determined, um, that can be calculated at 3% of annual worldwide gross revenues. So that's a big number, um, and uh, you can see these the the fault the the rest of the bullets on this slide are all under the previous um, maximum federal penalties. So, you know, Flight Hub that was strip pricing, misleading pricing claims um, about fees associated with seat selection on flights and the cost of cancellation rebooking. Um, Revive View, fifteen million um, deceptive free trial that turned into a subscription trap. Um, and StubHub drip pricing, Ticketmaster drip pricing, 
Hudson Bay mattresses, their ordinary sales price substantiation, and, and Michael's was a similar ordinary sales uh, pricing substantiation for, for framing. So um, those are the sanctions. Those are um, registered consent agreements in those bullets, um, which is not quite a settlement, but it's an agreement, you know, between the Competition Bureau and um, the firm to, you know, among other things, stop doing these things and to pay an administrative monetary penalty. There can also be, um, uh, you know, restitution made to affected consumers, a requirement to publish corrective notices. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of it's not on here, um, ran out of space with all these enforcement actions, but add standards, um, you know, they have self regulatory sanctions as well. So, if a consumer or a competitor challenges a misleading pricing claim or other deceptive um, representations, um, ad standards can request uh, the advertiser to amend or withdraw the ad. Um, and failing to do, um, you know, if an, if an advertiser fails to do that, um, you know, they can contact the Competition Bureau, carrying media, um, among other um, sanctions. So big high enforcement risk in Canada, I would say, and we've got some really high penalties that have just been um, bumped up last summer. Baran? Thank you, Kelly. Um, there's real enforcement risk in Turkey. The advertisement board is the main authority controlling advertisements in all media. The possible sanctions are temporary or permanent seize order against violating advertisements. It can also be monetary fine uh, jointly or separately. Uh, the advertisement board has recently been entitled to uh, impose, impose sanctions for prevention of access uh, to the online content advertisement or even the, to the entire website. Um, for your information, I just collected some uh, data about the statistics of uh, advertisement board cases and sanctions uh, imposed issues uh, within the last year, 2022. Um, for example, more than 21,000 of cases were reviewed by the advertisement board, either ex officio or upon complaint. It, the complaint can be uh, initiated by the rivals or uh, the consumers. There are around 1,700 cases uh, where the board issued various sanctions. The monetary fine issued by the advertisement board is about 42 million Turkish liras. Uh, it is about um, two or three million euros or US dollars. It's not a huge amount when it is compared to uh, other jurisdiction, uh, other jurisdictions, but it is still high uh, for uh, Turkey. And this is a, indeed a significant amount, and it sh it shows the volume of the uh, level of the scrutiny. Uh, conducted by the advertisement board. Um, at the next slide, uh, there are some prominent decisions uh, rendered within the last years. Uh, it, it also includes some uh, decisions from, from 2021 as well. Uh, the board in this could strictly examine the best price claims and most commonly uh, in all media and impose uh, important sanctions uh, to those who are uh, violating or infringing the uh, relevant rules. Uh, for example, the decision uh, rendered in August uh, 2022 is a prominent one uh, because there is comparison uh, of many prices. Um, say, sorry, uh, there is comparison uh, of prices for a no-name fragrance having the same or similar smell uh, with a famous one. Um, the visual of the famous fragrance is blurred, as you will see on the right side. Uh, however, the board held that it is still recognizable. It is still uh, the visual uh, of a famous. The board said that it is still uh, recognizable as a um, famous uh, fragrance. Uh, so the board held that uh, this should be considered as a direct and explicit comparison uh, of these brands. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, it is forbidden uh, in Turkey under the Turkish law. Uh, so, so the advertisement board uh, imposed section uh, against this advertisement based on uh, infringement violation of uh, explicit uh, comparison uh, principle, uh, ban of uh, this principle, and also imposed impose sanction um, 
uh, for unsubstantiation of these claims and degrading the others. Um, the board also, say sorry, <laughs> it's just late in Turkey, so sorry for any confusion. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired, so sorry for the for this. Uh, yes, what I would like to say that um, the advertisement board generally reviews uh, these um, advertisements, including uh, best prices or uh, best prices and impose sanctions to those. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Baran. Just one quick question back to you, if you allow. Um, I mean, this goes back to uh, what Brinsley uh, said before. It's on the Tesco case. So my question here would be, in your practice, um, do you see any clients that kind of calculate the, 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 the potential fine with, um, with the, or can compare it with the, um, if the profit they're, they're going to make so they just uh, check um, whether it's worth it to break the law or not and then they maybe break it i mean do you come across uh, uh, such examples or you would, would you say rather not well just the, the question is not clear to me uh, can you detail it yes i mean if if um I, I, I was just wondering if uh, you have uh, come across in your practice um, clients that kind of um, compare the, the likely sanction, the likely sanction being a fine, monetary fine, and then compare it with the profits they make out of the uh, potential uh, illegal uh, advertising practice. If, if, you, um, if there are any such clients that um, then based on that uh, make their decision to go forward with the advertising. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I guess there is not. The, 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 the answer should be, I guess there is not. I'm not sure about that. I don't have an accurate answer to your question. Sorry. Not a problem. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so then I would say we move on to the last um, chapter. And then, um, yeah, I mean, just what's, what's next. And uh, just to kind of provide you with an outlook in the um, various jurisdiction. And I would then uh, pass on again to Pavana. Great. Well, the uh, the big news in the U.S., of course, is when and how the FTC is going to codify its proposed revisions to the negative option rule. As I mentioned, they are pretty sweeping revisions. You know, I think one interesting thing to note is that at least in the proposed text of the rule, the FTC is not saying that uh, this would necessarily preempt state laws on point if those state laws have more restrictive requirements than what would be in the proposed negative option rule. Um, but at least it would establish more of a baseline, more of a compliance baseline for companies. So uh, this QR code will take you to a very brief article I wrote about this and of course available to, to discuss that. But that's the, uh, that's the next thing on deck in uh, dark patterns and conscriptions in the US. Yes, and in the UK also, um dark patterns the competition and markets authority i mentioned they're doing the um investigation into emma specifically but there's also this wider um deep dive into and call for evidence into the use of dark patterns um and that obviously includes elements which touch on pricing it's not only pricing the other thing i think because parvin has uh, mentioned subscription traps uh, it's worth saying that also today um, a new bill has started its legislative passage, which will take some time to be completed. Um, uh, but the new Digital Markets Act has, will be looking at, um, in particular, it's going to be capturing subscription traps and also um, fake reviews and false reviews. Um, so that's uh, I mean, it's it's interesting to me that we've got the competition and market, the consumer protection regulations, which ought to cover these things. Um, why we need another specific piece of legislation to deal with them, I think, uh, comes into question. The problem we seem to have in the UK is that we pass these laws and then we don't enforce them, and instead we just um, are overly reliant on the advertising stands authority. Kelly, over to you. I think looking forward, um, you know, we're all looking to whether federal enforcement, um, you know, what that's going to look like uh, following the, the big increase in penalties. 
Um, I think also class action risk is a huge area of, of growing risk in Canada, um, particularly under consumer protection legislation. And there is a private right of action also um, if you can prove damages for um, a business that can be proved to have knowingly or recklessly um, engaged in deceptive price representations like drip pricing or um, you know, failure to substantiate a regular price claim. Um, and in general, we're in sort of a renaissance of competition law right now in Canada. Um, and as I said before, our deceptive marketing practices provisions are under our antitrust legislation. And there's a, you know, there's, there was the summer kind of couple little changes made to the Competition Act, but it's part of a larger legislative overhaul. So it remains to be seen what, uh, you know, whether there, there are specific dark pattern um, provisions that get uh, um, pushed into force as well as part of that. Baran? Yeah, thank you. Based on the existing rules and in the light of the recent guideline enacted, we expect a diligent implementation of the principles and we expect a settled practice for the next years. Great, thank you very much. Um, I do have two uh, further questions. I make it uh, pretty quick, but the one I promised goes out to uh, Brinsley. So uh, to start with, um, I was wondering, I mean, you, you uh, mentioned it initially, um, the, the Brexit implications. So I was wondering, what is your take on, on the Brexit implications on, let's say, the advertising industry or uh, more specifically on advertising law? Maybe just very briefly. Very briefly, Brexit is a disaster. It continues to be a disaster nothing good has come of it um the interesting question over the next couple of years will be when we have a general election in the next year or two it is possible that we will then uh rejoin the single market if this piece of reform and repeal law goes through and basically uh expunges all of our legacy of eu-based laws from the statutes which could cover uh sort of advertising regulation, consumer protection, it could also cover IP law, then it will make it very difficult for us to even join the single market. Uh, and we will be trapped as this failing little island off Europe uh, for the rest of my life. The only good thing about all of that in, in, that, in relation to intellectual property law, of course, that is basically underpinned by a lot of international treaties and agreements in trademark law, copyright law, um, patent law, everything. So the ability of the UK government to sort of rip up a lot of um, IP law is very limited uh, because we'd still be party to these various international treaties. But consumer protection law potentially uh, could be ripped up to the extent it's based on European law and other types of advertising regulations. So I'm hoping against hope that um, this attempt by the by the Spartan Brexiteers will fail and it will leave the door open to, um, if not rejoining the European Union, at least being able to go back into the single market. Thank you very much. Still some uh, developments uh, in there. So uh, thank you very much for sharing and for uh, providing your take. So very, very lastly, um, I want to um, ask a question to all of you guys, just in really in one one sentence, um, what should the audience take take away um, from today's webinar uh, with respect to your jurisdiction? If you can uh, just uh, provide one sentence, if possible, Havana. Sure, happy to, happy to go first. Uh, I think the one sentence is, Order your subscription programs, uh, look at your user flows, look at your user design, um, really take this time now to, to do that exercise so you're not scrambling when the FTC proposes uh, actual revisions to the law. Thank you very much. So, Brinsley. Yes, I, I think I would take very much the same line. Uh, we've got more strict regulation coming in. Uh, we're moving, I think, towards a world where there's going to be more fines. Um, so, you know, the, the way in which you, you advertise your prices and comparisons, your subscriptions, reviews, all of these things are likely to come under more scrutiny, be more exposed to fines. So audit your marketing activities now 
uh, to try and get your house in order before these more draconian sanctions um, are introduced. Perfect, many thanks. Kelly? Um, I would echo those uh, words of wisdom. Um, you know, in Canada, we often see um, international companies test the market um, because it's very similar to a lot of other kind of consumer markets, including, you know, the US and the UK. Um, and, you know, maybe my one sentence is, you know, we're not the 51st state. We actually are a country with very different <laughs> regulations and particularly for pricing. And I see a lot of international lawyers shocked, appalled, concerned, surprised by how detailed Canadian pricing substantiation rules are, particularly when referencing a regular price. So um, watch out in Canada. Thanks a lot. Well done. Well, I advise advise advisors uh, to consult their legal cons counsels uh, before take any steps related with dark patents. I can definitely echo that. Thank you very much, Baron, for this uh, concluding remark. So, um, thank you very much for uh, staying with us. Um, I thought it very uh, helpful and insightful uh, to hear from all the jurisdictions. So, uh, big shout out to all uh, the speakers of today's webinar. And please do keep in touch with us. Um, you can see our email address uh, on the slide or connect with us on LinkedIn. And um, hope to see you soon on another webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jonas, for moderating. Take Thank care. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone.